Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today we're going to be talking about The Expanse while playing a bit of Space Engine. So, the the universe of The Expanse is well laid out. There's a whole bunch of books, uh, but one of the things that's kind of missing in a lot of cases is real discussion of distance and speeds in a universe where you have something as powerful and amazing as the Epstein Drive. And I kind of want to put some times and distances and velocities into some of the events in the story. So yes, there will be spoilers. If you've not seen the show, you might just want to go and watch some of my old, uh, my other science videos. But this is going to be really talking about brachistochrone trajectories, fusion drives, and getting places very fast. So this is 2200. It's January 18th. The reason I've chosen 2200 is because that is many, it's about 150 years before the purpo purported date of the show. I'm just going to start time here very slowly and uh, fire up the engines. Now, the story goes originally is that uh, when Solomon Epstein was testing his drive, it came in a little more powerful than he inspect expected. It started at 4G, quickly ramped up to 5, 6, 7, and then his instruments didn't go any higher than 7. Later in the story, however, he estimates that after 37 hours, he will be travelling just under 5% of the speed of light. And anybody that can do math will tell you that, well, we're talking about 11 Gs of acceleration there. To be fair, he was being crushed by the force of the acceleration, or the the force of his body as subjected to the acceleration. Therefore, his mathematical prowess might be getting challenged, especially when you consider that Solomon Epstein was someone that had grown up on Mars and was more used to one third of a G rather than 20 times that. But yeah, you'll see that after a minute, we've pretty much left Phobos behind. It has become a shadow behind us. And Mars, well, Mars that we're going to be passing soon enough. Now, to get through this, we can, of course, use time acceleration just to see how quickly things happen. The thing about accelerations is, of course, they build up over time. And, yeah, we're only moving, what, 16, 17 kilometers per second. But very quickly, we're you know, the things are getting faster and faster. And the the relative velocity of Mars... It's very quickly ramping up, and we're very quickly leaving it behind. Five minutes in, we've gone from the orbit of Phobos to basically blazing past the Terminator of the planet. Ten minutes, after ten minutes, it is literally becoming a crescent and a shadow behind us. So, 37 hours, one might wonder, how far can we actually get? Well, we can actually go into this external view and we can accelerate time a bit. So 1,000 hours, well, we're basically heading out into the asteroid belt here. It's kind of hard to tell, because I, I randomly selected a direction. I didn't know any specific details, but you can see I'm going out above uh, or below the plane of the ecliptic. Hard to tell, because I can't see which way the planets are moving at this time. That is the orbit of Ceres here, and this is the orbit of Jupiter. Eight hours in, we're definitely deep into the asteroid belt. By this point, Solomon Epstein is almost certainly dead. His, uh, his magnificent plans will carry humanity into a new age of exploration, conquest, and conflict, which is ripe for storytelling by a pair of authors who are interested in that kind of thing. Now, yeah, I chose the date 2200 because it's 150 years before the TV series. Now, to be clear, the actual date is kind of vague. The So the story very specifically says that it's about 150 years after Solomon Epstein's test of his drive system. So this is about right. However... The actual date of the TV, of his test is still kind of vague relative to the universe. But the, the Expanse was originally designed as a video game, believe it or not. It was a video game, an MMO universe, obviously great opportunities for t storytelling. And uh, Ty Frank put together a bunch of notes to uh, talk about, you know, to kind of to describe the universe that this game would take place in. 
Ultimately, uh, MMOs are expensive beasts and the thing wasn't made. So at some point he made a paper and pen RPG and and then uh, uh, later on Daniel Abraham got involved and they started writing books under the pen name of James S.A. Corey, who I previously thought was one person because I didn't do my research. But yeah, by the time his drive stopped running, Solomon Epstein would probably still be inside the orbit of Saturn. And he would hold all sorts of records for being the fastest human object ever constructed. Now, in 2200, I've worked out that the Voyager 1 spacecraft will probably be about 700 AU from Earth. At that distance, it will take Solomon Epstein about 80 days to finally exceed its distance record. And if we fast forward 150 years to the setting of the books, well, by then he would probably be about six to seven light years from the Earth. Are there any stars that close? Well, there are a few, but surprisingly few stars. Based on current scientific knowledge, there's uh, only three star systems within the, the seven light years of the Earth. We have, obviously, Proxima and Alpha Centauri, we have Barnard Star, and we have Lumen 16, which is actually a binary system of brown dwarfs. The only ones that are visible, of course, are Alpha Centauri. The other ones are too faint to be seen unless you have a telescope. So yeah, in the stories, it's possible that Solomon Epstein could be flying by one of these stars, but most likely he's off in some other direction, in deep freeze, and perhaps waiting for aliens to wake him up in the 25th century. Now let's return to the solar system to actually talk about how we navigate through the solar system in uh, this universe. Now at the start of 2350, I'm going to point out that right away, uh, Saturn is up here and Ceres is down here. And if you know the stories, you'll know that the Canterbury is a, an important part of the stories. And it spends a lot of the show, or it, spends a, it spent a lot of its life, pardon me, transferring ice from between Ceres and Saturn. It trawls the ice from the belts of Saturn, sorry, the, the rings of Saturn, and transports it to Ceres. Now, at the start of 2350, Ceres and Saturn are on other sides of the Sun. So, yeah, that is the longest, that is about just about the furthest they could possibly be apart. That's about 12 AU, and you know, you can actually use the, the Brachistochrone trajectory to figure out just how fast you could travel from one side to the other if you used a constant acceleration uh, burn. So 12 AU accelerating at uh, 0.3 G for the first 6 AU and then decelerating at 0.3 G for the second half, uh, that takes about 18 days, which, you know, is actually pretty fast. I mean, you know, ships cross the ocean in, in that kind of time. So it really puts things in perspective that even in the worst position, the worst possible configuration, the magic power of this Epstein drive could actually make that in a few weeks. Now, when they are close together, right, if you wait for the orbits to get into the correct orientation, then uh, the distance gets down to maybe 6 or 7 AU, and the time drops to maybe 12 days. The It's important to realize that although you've half the distance, it's more like a square root behavior because the because you're spending time accelerating and decelerating and the further you go the faster you go now that's also also begs the question you know just how fast would they be going at peak velocity traveling between these two locations well if uh if you were talking about again the start of 2350 where they're on the opposite sides and you're traveling 12 au if you're accelerating at 0.3 g continuously you would reach about 2300 kilometers per second or about 0.75 of a uh, percent of the speed of light so that is pretty stunning speeds and velocities here now it's worth noting a spacecraft traveling at 0.75 percent of the speed of light it's less than one percent but that's still a lot of kinetic energy Every kilogram of spacecraft has kinetic energy equivalent to the energy content of 500 tons of TNT. In a distant future where everybody can fly around thanks to the power of nuclear fusion, everything is a potential weapon. In another sci-fi universe, this is expressed as the Zinti lesson. 
which says a reaction drive's effectiveness as a weapon is directly proportional to its effectiveness as a drive. Anyway, before we get too deep into the rabbit hole of discussing sci-fi weapons, uh, yeah, we should actually talk about Eros. Eros, of course, is where a lot of important things happen, and it does, well, it does start moving under its own power. At the start of 2350, it's actually very close to Earth, although because it's on an eccentric orbit, it's actually moving away from Earth relatively quickly. It's going downwards. Now, at some point obviously in the show uh it ends up having to, it ends up deciding that it wants to travel towards earth and then there's a whole bunch of exchange of weapons and discussions about uh, emergency procedures the important thing to know at no point is it more than say 2 AU from earth how long would it take something that can accelerate at 10 plus g to uh, cover 2 AU? Would it take days, weeks, months? Was the drama in the TV show really exaggerated based upon the timelines that they required? Well, you know, back of an envelope calculation. If you are 2 AU from the Earth and you are accelerating at, you know, 10G, you can cover that distance in less than two days, including a accelerate and slow down in that time so yeah it totally makes sense that there would be the crisis on the earth as all this uh, as eros is starting to move towards it at incredible speeds finally i want to talk about that great scene in season two where alex kamal a pilot of the roshanati who's been hiding out on the little moon of selene on the edge of the Jovian system plots a many many gravity assists to get down into at the core of the jo Jovian system and, of course, sneak in through the back door of Ganymede so he can save his friends. That's all great in theory, and I'm sure it's absolutely possible to interact with this myriad of moons here. Selene is actually a very, very tiny piece of rock. It's only about two kilometers. Ganymede is down in here. What isn't mentioned is that Selene is on a two-year orbit. Getting down here, even on just a straight Hopeman transfer orbit, would take about a year, which is fine if you're a space probe, not so fine if you're trying to rescue your friends from some sort of weird proto-molecule hybrid thing that's going to kill them. Or, and of course, the inevitable failure of the oxygen recycling system on Ganymede. Yeah, great in theory, but... Somebody needed to do the math before they actually put that in the show. <laughs> and also somebody needed to check the pole, the rotation uh, of Jupiter because the FX shots messed that up. Okay, it's fun to poke jokes at it. I'm looking forward to the third season. And uh, yeah, hope to see you then. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>